I want to uh, just kind of go back a little bit. I want people to understand what are the def different ways to invest in precious metals? You know, you have bullion and you have uh, physical bars, ingots, which people don't know about. So I just right. want to people to understand how, if I want to invest in precious metals, should I invest in gold? Should I invest in silver? And how should I invest in those precious, precious metals? Should I invest in platinum? The fiat money is going to transition into the digital currency by what the end of the year, or I know everything's moving. Um, actually, in this country, uh, the, we're kind of behind the eight ball in that. In China, they're already running tests, but in this country, they say that they'll be ready by 2022, 2023. So we have a lot more pain to feel. And the way that they're going to do it, they've already announced it. They've already put all the things in place. They're called the FedNow accounts. And uh, they're inside of the banking system because banks have that long-term, what they call sticky relationship with uh, people. Although the unbanked are now, they're really pushing to get the unbanked in the system as well. And the way that they're going to lure you in is by universal income. So universal basic income, right? And there, where there were some qualifications for getting that you know, stimulus check, there's gonna be no qualifications for getting this. So everybody's gonna have a certain basic amount a month. I've heard 2,000, I've heard 4,000. I don't know how much it's gonna be. I thought that they, that might happen um, toward the end of this year, but it didn't, but we're very close to that because of all that money printing that I showed you. Um, we're gonna go ahead. I have a, well, I have a question real quick about gold. There's questions in the chat, but we're gonna go around the room. But Wanda had a couple of questions too. Okay. Um, uh, gold, this issue with gold. You can first ask me all, anything. First of all, the, the word on the street is cryptocurrency is exceeding the value in gold. Well, the market value. It only has value because you agree that it has value. And they had to get us used to it and comfortable with the cryptocurrencies. So, hey, Bitcoin at now 32 or 33,000. I mean, I've, I've been watching it since it was seven cents. You know, I am not a trader. That's not my mentality. I'm a long-term strategist. But what value does it really have unless you and I agree? And where is the utility, the only utility that I can see in it so far is that you can put it on a little thumb drive and the wallet, the wallet. take it with you in a wallet. Yes. It's at 34, but, 34, it's going up. <laughs> of course sorry. it is. Of course it is because that's what gets the eyeballs. But you, can you please tell me why it's worth $34,000? What can you do with it besides take it somewhere else? I can buy property with it. Can you? If you find somebody that'll accept it, I wouldn't accept it for property, but there's certainly people that will. What about the goal? We're gonna to get to people's questions. What about transferring the goal? I have an issue with that. If I'm moving, from place to place, how do I store my goal? And you know, I don't want to store my goal in some um, company and they're going to charge me a surcharge to store my goal somewhere in a different country. Right. Do um, you have any comments around that? I definitely do because it depends everything and no matter what you do anywhere, it needs to be based upon your goal. So if your goal was to move to another country and be able to carry your wealth, there are all sorts of quality levels. It's the gold content's the same, but there are quality levels, blemish levels, and there's a global market. So uh, this doesn't seem like that big a deal to carry, does it? Uh, it just depends on, it depends. I, 
I lose things. Because when you go across the border, well, I can't account for that. You probably want to be more careful with it. But if you lose it, at least you lose it. Cryptocurrencies and what's happening in the crypto space right now with security, there are a lot of people that have lost a lot of money in cryptocurrencies that that money has just been hacked and vanished. So how do you account for that? Wait, and money the other thing is hacked? jewelry as well. The money's been hacked or the institutions that were se securing it, the platforms that secured or were unsecured were hacked. That's what yeah. I'm hearing a lot of that too. And I, I don't understand, you know, I'm hearing that because crypto is not, it's, it's supposed to be inhackable, but we can get into that. Oh, it's very hackable. Look at what's going on. And here's the other part of that. Like we saw in China that they can shut down an exchange really easily. So then how do you get your money out? So I, I'm not telling you not to do it. First of all, and, and chances are pretty good with all of the adoption of the institutional investors right now, they're creating a base point for it. So I see the utility in moving it and I see, but it, it, it's still, it's value. How's it valued? I mean, I guess that's where I have a lot of heartburn is who says it's worth $34,000? Who says it's worth $10? I'm gonna let Wanda had a couple of questions for you, then we can open it up to everybody because people have questions now. And I don't Absolutely. Pick up all well, well, Lynette, I wanna back it up just a little bit because I sure. know China has gone to a digital currency. Yep. And well, they're, all... they're, they haven't formally come out with it yet, but they are running testing in it in a bunch of places. Yes. Right, and they've been testing it for a little over five years. Um, but they are also buying a lot of gold. Yes, they are. And they're going into Africa specifically, uh, buying up gold like crazy. So I want to uh, just kind of go back a little bit. I want people to understand what are the def different ways to invest in precious metals? You know, you have bullion and you have uh, physical bars, ingots, which people don't know about. So I just right. want to people to understand how, if I wanted to invest in precious metals, should I invest in gold? Should I invest in silver? And how should I invest in those precious, precious metals? Should I invest in platinum? Well, gold and silver, gold's the primary currency metal, silver's the secondary currency metal. Platinum is more rare, but it's used, it's more of an industrial metal. So, for me, since this is definitely a currency life cycle issue, my focus is on gold and silver. And silver, for me, is also more of a barterable, oops, a barterable tool. And, you know, it, it, what we do here at ITM Trading is there's a strategy that's based upon the repeatable patterns. And then there's so much talent here, we've just made it a whole lot stronger. So the first thing you should do, no matter what you're doing, is define what you're trying to accomplish. And then it's the right tool for that job. So for example, one thing that we all have to do is be able to sustain our current standard of living. And that means food, water, energy, security, barterability, wealth preservation, community, and shelter. No matter where we are, no matter what is happening in the economy, these are the things that we need to have a reasonable standard of living. So, um, and food does become the single biggest issue for people during these transitions. And unfortunately, right now, we are seeing more people die from hunger than we are even from COVID. So, you know, you've got to secure your food. Personally, I converted my entire property into an urban farm. And I like to share the food that I produce, but knowing that that's the single biggest issue, you know, I think everybody needs to secure some form of food. Not everybody can do an urban farm, but there are ways that you can do it on a much smaller scale. I mean, if you're in a tiny little apartment, 
you can buy sprouting seeds. They're not very expensive, maybe 10, 15 bucks. You can buy a pound of sprouting uh, uh, seeds. Broccoli seeds are the most nutritious. You rinse them off with water in three days, you have live food, right? Beans and rice. Pardon? Are you saying the new power um, businesses where if you grow, you have plants that grow? Yes. Power? That's. Like, Yes, and I'm doing that as well, but I'm doing, they're doing aquaponics where you have to add minerals and stuff to the water. Even easier and cheaper because I'm about sustainability is aquaponics where you get a little 10 gallon fish tank and you put some goldfish or whatever in there and then that water is what circulates through the system so you don't have to add any minerals or whatever. So that's much more sustainable. And yeah, you can do it in just a very tiny, tiny space. So it just kind of depends on your circumstance and what you can do. But that's really what I'm, that's a big piece of what I'm all about. And then water. I mean, you can't live without food and water. You can live without gold and silver and cryptocurrencies. But you need, you need food and water. So you want to make sure that, like I've put in ponds, on my and I only have a half an acre. It's not like I have a very big piece. I have a half an acre. But I've still put in ponds, and I'm in Phoenix, and so, you know, how much rain do we really get here? But I want to catch what is raining. So that's my rain catchment, and then I could just filter it through, I have a Berkey water filter, and now I've got drinkable water, and I'm not putting any chemicals in my water either, which is cheaper, right? So I'm looking for things that are really um, sustainable. Security, look, when people are hungry and hopeless, they make choices they would not otherwise make. So personally, my whole property is ringed with what I call food hedges. So that if somebody's hungry, they can walk by. My neighbors do. They come and harvest, you know, but they can walk by and they can pick a pomegranate or they can pick a cherry or they can pick an orange or, you know, whatever. And I've had a lot of people tell me, well, the mobs are just going to come in and destroy everything. Well, that's not within my control, right? I'm hoping and thinking that if they know that they can come back every day and make sure that they can feed their children that maybe they won't do that, right? Maybe they won't. Maybe they'll realize that this is a, a good, safe place and it's something that can be sustained. So people plant trees, why not plant a food tree? Like an apple or a peach or a pomegranate or whatever, right? Depending upon uh, where you are. So that security issue is you want to do that too in layers so that you can feel safe and secure. And the community, that's why I'm doing this. And that's why I was so excited to be able to do this. Because we are much stronger together than we are as individuals. And so inside of your community and in the broader community, if there's something you can do to help somebody, help them. You know, it's really simple. You know, we talk about energy. That comes back, you know, tenfold that energy comes back to you. The barter ability, in reality, any talent that you possess and anything that is physical is barterable. The difference between that and gold and silver is this is just universal money. It's universal money. Everybody understands gold and silver. So, and, and you should also understand that in any form, it's monetary at its base. So when you talk about what should you have, you don't have to have coins. If you have Aunt Bessie's, you know, sterling candlesticks or salt and pepper shakers, or, you know, I even have some sterling silver chopsticks. Sterling silver is 92.5% pure. 14 karat gold is 56% pure. 18 karat is set. And it doesn't matter if it's bent or broken or tarnished or dinged. 
it's monetary at its base. So when I travel overseas, I just have some really simple gold and silver chains that I can wear underneath my clothing. Because if something happens with the credit card you have or the debit card you have, or nobody will accept the cash that you have, you have gold and silver. And they are severely, this is the opportunity, they are severely, severely undervalued. And how do you know it's in a long-term positive trend regardless of what anybody blah, blah, blah says? In a positive trend, you will see, give me that back, come on. You will see a series of higher and higher lows. Here's a low, here's a low, here's a low, here's a low, right? A series of higher and higher lows. Because if you keep getting higher and higher lows, this is true for Bitcoin, this is true for stocks, this is true for bonds, until it's not anymore, until they lop off zeros. But that's how you know you're in a positive trend. Because you see a series of higher and higher lows. You keep getting that, you're going to get higher highs. Conversely, how do you know you're in a negative trend? Because you will see, and I don't have a dollar graph on here, but you will see a series of lower and lower highs. And if you keep, let me see if I've got something that can show that. Okay, like look at this. This is the monetary velocity. What do you have here? A series of lower and lower highs. And if I showed you a purchasing power chart, that's what you'd see. Lower high, lower high, lower high, lower highs. And with the dollar, that's the real trend. So as long as you can convert those cryptocurrencies into land or into goods or into services, awesome, awesome. But you want to be diversified because what if you don't? So if you've got that over here, if you've got stock, bonds, and mutual funds over here, this is your wealth insurance. You have car insurance, you have house insurance, you have health insurance. This is your wealth insurance. So with the possibility of hyperinflation, should we be buying assets now? Well, most, okay, again, it, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. But I'm an ex-stockbroker and I'm an ex-banker. I do not personally own one stock, one bond, one CD, one mutual. I don't own any of that garbage because of exactly what you said, Wanda. We're going into hyperinflation. All this money that they're printing, it just hasn't made it here yet. But when UBI, Universal Basic Income, and everybody feels comfortable, they're going to get their $4,000 at the beginning of the month, and it's going to be pumped into those Fed Now accounts, and they can go out and they can spend it, you're going to see this start to ratchet up. That's why I said this is the most important chart on the money supply, because when you see that going up, in a pervasive way, because, hey, we had a little blip here and a little blip there. So when you see it in a pervasive way, that's how you will know, regardless of the Fed going, yeah, but we're going to let inflation run hot. Oh, my God, if I could reach through the screen and throttle those guys, I would. When you see this starting to go up in a pervasive way, then you know you better take shelter because the hyperinflation is here. And once UBI comes out so that the masses start to spend all the money that is currently held in the stock system and the bond system and the mutual funds and the derivative bets and all of this financial innovation garbage that they've created to transfer your wealth and your the efforts of your labor their way. If you don't have gold and silver by then, I, I, I mean, look, this has been tried and true for 6,000 years. This has been tested. This is part of the dynastic wealth base. Dynastic wealth is wealth that's held in families at least 300 years. So you think about the Queen of England. What does she own? She owns real estate. She owns rare collectibles. She owns rare jewels. She owns gold and silver. That's what she owns. Now, taxpayers pay her living expenses, but 
there was a period of time after 2008 when England was getting into a little bit of a problem and the Queen's coffers were a little bit low. And the article said, I don't have that with me, I'd have to find it again. But the article said, but it's not a problem because if she really needed more money, she could just sell one of the priceless art paintings or what have you. But so when she made that money off the back of the people, her, her, her people in her country. Hello. Really, that money belongs to those people. Yeah, hello. No. And just to clarify for everybody, the Federal Reserve is now AKA Central Bank, right? Yes, it is It is one of the global central banks. Why did they and, change the name to make it global? Me? Why did they change the, the title from federal to, because it's global now? They want to collaborate with all um, the- No, they're not global. The International Monetary Fund that is global is made up of every central, almost every central bank head and every treasury secretary in the world. And they're really the ones that are driving this bus. So when you see a synchronized global recovery or a synchronized downturn, that's because those guys all get together and they're all on the same page and they're blowing a lot of smoke and mirrors. And that's the IMF. That's the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. Um, really, I'm in their website all the time. They write papers all the time. They talk about taking us digital because then there are no limitations on the interest they can charge on your accounts. And they used an example of 4% so that when you see your account dropping and you know you're not spending any money, and you know it's because the bank's charging you interest and you can't pull it out in cash, well, what are you most likely to do? Go spend it in anything that you think might retain its value, which is exactly what happens during hyperinflation. So, yeah, right now when you're talking about the central banks, because there's the ECB, the European Central Bank, the PBOC, the China Central Bank, Japan's got a central bank, they all have a central bank. There's 196 countries in the world and 189 of them are members of the IMF. Um, but what we're really experiencing in here, they want to retain control. The guys that got us into this mess want to remain in control going into this new currency and this new this reset economy that is a sharing economy but who are they sharing with not us that's why you have to become your own central banker and well i just wanted to say because i didn't i didn't really answer the question on buying the assets right now those assets whether they're stocks or their bonds or their real estate or their cryptos are extraordinarily overvalued, right? Tell me why it's worth 35. I mean, I remember it at seven cents, right? Tell me why it's worth $35. But what happens during a reset is that what is currently overvalued will come down in value. And what is currently undervalued, gold and silver, will go up near its true value. And it'll overshoot both ways. So a big part of the strategy is to take the gains that you got here and convert it into those assets then, right? And you'll know that. Here's my one of my very favorite patterns. It's one that I talk about all the time. There's a cup formation. It looks like the bottom of a cup. And you can see it in everything when it's an accumulation. So when the smartest guys in the room are starting to accumulate, they do it really quietly and they accumulate those assets, and then they get you involved to push the prices up even further, which is exactly what's happening right now in stocks and raw, naive public, right? Naive public, when they get in, and then all of a sudden, the game of musical chairs stops, guess who's less left holding the bag? So that's when they say, everybody's been saying, we're experiencing the greatest wealth transfer in history Who's getting that wealth? The one percent, the corporations, right? Because exactly. they're off of 
I've heard that a lot. I've heard that from financial services people, and but nobody's ever said who's actually benefiting. Well, the, you can see it right here. I mean, this is just one example. I could do a whole presentation just on that. But there's that wealth transfer. This is since the crisis. You know, I mean, have, have you know who's benefiting from this crisis? You know, Elon Musk, the wealthiest man in the world right now since March. What's his his wealth has gone up? How many trillions of dollars? And Jeff Bezos, how many trillions of dollars has his wealth gone up? where people are having a hard time putting food on the table and you know the rent moratoriums are gone now and the mortgage moratoriums are gone now we haven't seen the impact of that yet that's but why people know. are going to love the great reset <laughs> because they're going to get oh. this money we're going to get this money two thousand three thousand four thousand dollars a month and we're going to be happy because now we think we can survive and, and and so I'm I'm questioning the capitalistic system. There's you something know, to question. I would be the first person to say that I am a capitalist, but we don't have a capitalist system. We have a fascist system where the corporations are more important than the population. In a real capitalist system, when you fail, you fail. But what happened? When they failed, and as they failed, they got bailed out by the masses, by the taxes. So we're not in a capitalist system at all. I think that's a great system. You rise or you fall based upon your own efforts and endeavors. That's fair. But the capitalist system hasn't been fair to many people. It's been fair to some. The crony capitalist system hasn't been. Yeah, right. well, yeah, we can make that distinction. But what about debt? What about people who are in debt? With, okay. What's going to happen? That, well, what hap if you have, there's two kinds of debt. There's self-liquidating debt and there's non-self-liquidating debt. Non-self-liquidating, you know, self-liquidating debt is, you know, maybe you take on, this is not so true anymore, but you take on a loan to uh, expand your business and you get more money and that pays that debt off. So it's self-liquidating debt. Non-self-liquidating debt is the government builds a bomb and they let the bomb off. Psh, that's it. They've just taken on debt. We have been, they started moving us into this system back in the 20s when they started giving everybody credit, right? So if you have credit card debt, that's a variable rate debt. Right now, the government is intentionally and openly suppressing interest rates. Though I dare say, for these corporations, they're actually getting it at negative rates. But if you have a credit card, you're probably paying 23, 26% or more or something like that. So there's just a few little people that, that uh, collect interest and the rest of us pay it. But that variable rate debt is absolutely killer. So if you have that variable rate debt, you never, ever get out of debt, especially during a reset because interest rates go to the moon and your income will not keep up with it. So you will never be able to get out of that debt. Fixed rate debt is a different story as long as you have something to offset it because a fixed rate debt um, and this is the strategy that the government has used, right? Through inflation, you're repaying that debt with dollars that have less and less and ultimately no value, right? So part of the strategy, let's say you have a mortgage on a house. And let's just make life easy for a minute and say your mortgage is 10000 bucks. Well, what you want to do is have the equivalent not on the whole mortgage, but all right, let, let's just say right now, again, just to make life easy, you've got spot at $2,000 an ounce when it should be at $10,000 an ounce. That's its true fundamental value. And we can go into that as well, right? So right now, if you were going to pay off that mortgage, it would take all $100,000. 
or you can buy 10 ounces of gold or the equivalent. And when the system resets, then what would take you all 10 ounces might only take you a 20th of an ounce or a quarter of an ounce or something like that. You convert it into dollars, bam, you pay off that debt. So can you roll that over to, an, uh, like roll an IRA over to gold? You can do a gold IRA. Yes, you can. Um, but, you know, again, you have to always look at why these things were created and what the structure is of them because most of the gold held by individuals in, this, in the world, really, uh, is held inside of retirement plans like an IRA. You can do a gold IRA. But you're limited as to what you can buy. So we were talking about the different kinds of gold. You can only buy gold bullion. And make no mistake, a bar, an ingot, anything minted, you know, after 1986, that's all, where, wherever it is in the world, that is all classified as bullion. So that is not the kind of gold that I buy for myself. I'm not concerned about confiscation with silver, but I am with the gold. So my personal preference, and I, I had this experience, that's why, is to do the collectible gold. And the reason is, since they can easily and cheaply manipulate the spot market, so let's say they decide to confiscate when spots at 3,000 bucks an ounce. And they say, okay, well, we're going to take all the gold out of your IRA, but we're going to leave you $5,000. I don't know why, if anybody could explain this one to me, it'd be great. Why people still believe in Wall Street <laughs> after you've been beaten and bloodied and bruised enough. But most people would say, well, wow, gold's only worth, you know, 3000 but hey, they're willing to pay me 5000 Okay. And they leave all those worthless pieces of paper then how are you better off? Additionally, if you've got spot at 18 or 1900 bucks, when they do the reset, even if they didn't do that, and it goes to its fundamental value, which currently is somewhere north of 12,000, what do you want to pay taxes on? 1800 or 12,000? So I had a SEP IRA. I liquidated that, and I still have a retirement plan, but it's in my control. Absolutely in my control. Now, mind you, I don't plan on, this is where I plan on making my last stand, is in Arizona, so I don't really plan on going outside of the country because I don't really think any place is going to be better off than any other place. This is a global issue. But... Um, you know, I, I feel more comfortable with collectible gold. And I'll tell you why, actually. Because my uncle was a major antique dealer. And I don't know why. Again, some of these things that you just remember and they stick with you. He was my favorite uncle. We were really close. And one day, my parents and I were up at his house. And he said, come here, I want to show you something. And we went back in one of the back bedrooms. And he had two tall floor safes. And he said, if anything should happen to me, Aunt Bertie will be well taken care of for the rest of her life because of what's in these safes. And when I turned around to see what was in those safes, there were a whole bunch of these pre-1933, because he'd go into a house, and that's how he was able to buy it, at $35 an ounce, by the way. Um, and you couldn't fit one more gold coin in there. So at that time, I would have been 1964, at that time, it was illegal to hold more than five ounces of gold, except in the way that he held it. And I want the kind of gold that I can use in the normal marketplace so that I can convert it from when it goes to overvaluation or even fair valuation when those income producing assets go to undervaluation. Do you see what I'm saying? Absolutely. So because of my personal experience, I have the highest level of comfort with that. So when I look at what I'm gonna do, 
then I look at what can I hold in an IRA. If I can hold it in an IRA, I'm not buying it. Because I want to be in the same classification as the guys that get to write the rules. And there are one ounce, half ounce gold coins that'll go for $8 million. Well, who can afford that? Only people that either get to write the rules or have the ability to influence those that write the rules. And you don't have to pay $8 million for this. It's a premium, no doubt about it. But again, wealth insurance, because I want to be able to go out and buy those that whoever survives it, income producing stocks, even cryptos, who's going to survive? Nobody knows yet. That's a big experiment. Nobody knows yet. So this is my wealth insurance. I know that we're going in the, in the direction of digital because we're in the surveillance economy. Mm -hmm. So but I will convert as I need it. For the sake of time, Lynn, let's let some let's move on and, and see some uh, some some of our uh, participants have some questions too. Lindy, do you have any questions? Oh, Denise. Hi. No, I don't. But I really do want to say that I appreciated the um, the explanation of why Lynette wants to buy gold. Um, the, the gold, the collectible gold coins. It makes a lot of sense because you see on television that they're selling. Well, you can buy gold bars, you can buy this, you can buy that. But but the way that that is measured out, it's easy. It's portable. You can't carry a gold bar with you to Mexico or wherever it is you're going to go. And and it's in small enough measures that you can actually carry it with you. And, and barter if you needed to. So I really appreciate that. Thanks so much. I like that idea too, Cindy. Cindy, um, just tell the group you're an entrepreneur um, here, what, what you do. I uh, recently started a podcast. It is a career podcast. It's called the Insiders Career Club. And the podcasts are, there's actually two prongs of it. One is I, I interview professionals that have been in their roles for a while to give everyone that is looking, whether you are somebody that's returning to the workforce, a college student, somebody that's already in the workforce is looking to make a career change or just looking for a job, period. Give people the ideas of different careers that are um, available to them because a lot of these careers Unless you're in the industry, you don't know anything about them. So it's exposure, but it's also education from the other side because I do podcasts. I've been a, uh, an executive in the talent acquisition function within companies for 25 years. And so I want to share the knowledge that I have with those that are just coming up and those that are looking for, for jobs because people don't always understand the reasoning why behind they didn't get a job or what they need to do to get a job. And so I'm taking all the, all the information that I have as well as looking at trends because I have a business news and trends section on my website as well uh, to, to educate people and let them know what's going on so that they're not, you know, this is a time where people have been caught flat footed and especially people of color and I really want to help them have an edge and, and know what's going on from a, a hiring perspective to help them find work. And um, Cindy is joining the Odos Network because this is what we do. We empower African-American female entrepreneurs and women of color. And actually Cindy is an old friend of over 30 years and she's pivoting um, from being a full-time uh, recruiting executive into her own business. So congratulations, my love. <laughs> Bravo. We'll be tuning into um, your podcast and your services and sharing that on our platform. Um, congratulations and thank you for joining. Uh, who else had some questions? There was somebody else in the chat that had um, Thanks, Claudia. There was another young lady. Who was it? Hi, this is Tierra Turner. How are you? 
Hi, Tierra. Thanks for joining. Uh, I'm glad I caught you online. Thanks for joining. Can you tell us your business and ask your question? Sure. So my business is the Ivy Eternal Enterprise, which is focused on community development. And it's primarily focused on um, areas of like community health and service. But it's really to help connect underserved communities to resources. So it's a connection tool. It's a now it's a virtual connection tool. And I, I started this business because I felt like to minimize or sh or shorten the disparity of accomplishment, not necessarily success, because success is relative and happiness and all other stuff, but it's really about education and informing our families and being able to have children, because it's a, primarily for children, the access to things. A forum would be something like this, a travel group, fencing, all the other different things that the world has that I feel like certain underserved communities, families don't know about them and they can't get them. They, their families cannot get the children to them. So that's the background for my business. Um, I, I appreciate everything, um, Lynette. I was referred to you by a coworker. She, you know, we started talking about strategies and investments and where to look into. So she said, research more about your business. And you know, so this is my first introduction to all these businesses, which I applaud and I appreciate. I am confused about when you start to purchase gold and or silver, around when can you redeem them and what merchants accept them? Well, you can, you can accumulate. And at this moment, when you're ready to redeem them, you would simply, you want to work with a reputable dealer because they'll have buybacks and they'll reveal everything to you. So they'll buy it back from you. And that takes like about really however long it takes to ship it because it's in your possession. And that's the way you want to do it. You want direct access to it. Uh, now, personally, there have definitely been many times when I have used this to barter. So if I go to a doctor, a lawyer or anywhere I'll get, that I'm going to purchase some services, I'll give them an option. Do you want fiat? Do you want gold? Do you want a combination of the two? So it's on a one-on-one -on -one basis. However, when the hyperinflation kicks into gear and it becomes obvious to everybody how quickly the currency is losing value, then like in, um, well, wow, in 2013 and 14 during the sovereign debt crisis, a lot of silver came out and gold jewelry came out. And that's how a lot of families and people survived so and definitely when we're at hyperinflation if you have silver or gold people are aware of that particularly since everything is now connected to the internet so it'll be very easy to convert um, additionally i'm still doing some work on this so bear with me a little bit but there is a new gold product it's called gold backs where you get one one thousandth of an ounce that's embedded in uh, a bill. So it's sonically sealed and they go through this whole big process. Now in that particular case, um, they don't have a lot of merchants yet, but that's something that will be worked on. So that people that understand and are concerned about the hyperinflation in the currency, so that's really kind of at its infancy stage, but I think it's a fantastic concept. I, I love it. And stay tuned for more about it. But right now, the easiest and fastest way is whoever you buy it from, you want to make sure that they have a buyback policy in writing that you can read so that they can't just change their mind. Mm -hmm. uh, and you want to work with a reputable dealer. We reveal everything. We reveal all the fees, all the spreads. We reveal the good, the bad, the ugly, because we really like our clients to be educated. So okay. it is how do you determine uh, a reputable dealer? Well, you could go to the Better Business Bureau and you can see, you know, the level of complaints and how the company has dealt with those complaints. And you really want somebody that is very transparent, you know, so do they reveal everything? Not just do they send you legalese with itty bitty, you know, words that people kind of glaze over and don't read, but do they take the time to educate you? 
If they do, then they're probably going to be more upfront with everything else. If they don't, you probably want to go someplace else. Or if they say, nah, don't worry about it. Because honestly, when I, I've been here at ITM since 2002. And this is really basically a kind of a good old boy industry. There are very few women in this industry, although in our office we have quite a few because probably because of me. Um, but I, well, frankly, I was really instrumental in the development, but these, but the people that were here would be Roger and Craig, they had a lot of integrity. I'm, I'm not going to be able to work for somebody or with somebody that does not have the same level of integrity that I do. And so, I mean, that's how, that's how you do it, is you find somebody that is willing to really educate you. And, you know, for me, I think having a strategy is critically important because, oh, you buy the gold, you buy the silver, and then what do you do with it? Well, there's a whole strategy based upon those repeatable patterns because everything has a pattern. I mean, I have a five-year-old granddaughter. I guarantee you she's in a different part of her life cycle than I am at 66. And currencies and markets are no different. You know, you, you, I just showed you some of the patterns that just repeat. So, you know, you can buy gold and silver. That really doesn't take rocket science. But um, I think most people really need more of a plan of how to walk through this whole transition. If I knew this stuff back in 1971, when they made it legal to own gold again, I would have been buying the Hades out of it at $42.22. Instead, I bought a stupid purse, right? <laughs> Because, because who knew? They don't want you to understand this. But you know now, because you guys are all watching this, that 100%, 100 there's not even one little doubt in my mind that we've already begun walking through the reset. And maybe, maybe we'll have another couple years to get ready. Once those CBDCs, those central bank digital dollars are done or digital currencies are done, then it's game over because they've got the whole system in place. Rhonda. Yes. Rhonda, may I take my question now? This is Denise. Sure. Okay, thank you. And thank you ever so much, Lynette, for being my friends. Pleasure. I've been following you uh, of recently, and I have a young niece who's aligning me. My question is in reference to buying the gold. We come to your company, let's say we open up a, an account. Mm -hmm. Is it stored... Um, as a holding company within your, okay. And that is not how you want to do it. If you don't hold it, you don't own it. Look at the contract. Okay. So you definitely want it in your possession. Now, of course, if you're doing an IRA, then, I mean, there are some nuances that enable you to hold it closer to you. But generally speaking, in an IRA, you're not going to be able to hold it. That's then what about a trust, uh, having um, something like a spin thrift trust or something of that oh, nature? You can, I, all you my, mind. yeah, all my stuff is, all we need is the first, uh, the first top page of the trust. You can totally okay. do this inside of a trust. No problem. Okay. Now they're bringing out um, the, with the varying currencies market globally. Um, are you taking even foreign currency to convert over into the gold or will you do Not yet. straight up? Yeah, because everybody is in the same boat. And, you know, the dollar might be weaker or stronger against the euro or yen today, but in all circumstances, every single one, they all are losing purchasing power value. And that's what really matters to you and me. What can we buy with this money? So now if we have friends that are living abroad, everything uh -huh. has to converge to US, USD, US dollars, and then we buy from yourself, and then um, we hold our own gold. Yes, and uh, there are, there are uh, a number of clients, and now uh, please understand that I don't really work with clients anymore because I'm buried in all of the research. Sure, sure. So there very well could be people here that understand this better than I do. But I do know for a fact that we have one off the top of my head, a client that lives in France. 
And, um, you know, when you bring this in, again, it has a face value of $20. You would then go to the TSA and ask for a private room. And this is your private and personal collection. And because they'll total up the $20 rather than the $1,800 or wherever it is, you can take a whole lot of gold in there. You know, does it, it doesn't cap at 10000 though? It does, but this is okay. that $20 increments versus okay. the bullion Excellent. coin at $2,000, right? Okay. So we can that, even that's move the it. beauty part of it. That's okay. one of the beauty parts of it. Okay. And and one more clarification, ladies. If I, you, you mentioned that um, their goal is to have everyone on the same uh, economic level base. What is that reference to UBI? I didn't get the full initials on that. Universal. Oh. Oh, universal basic income, UBI. Okay. And, and if you listen, they can also refer to it as MMT, which is modern money theory, which is we can just print money to the moon. So that they level everyone's debt across the globe, even throughout our state, our country. Right. And then they give you a dollar figure monthly. They'll, yeah, they'll give you... I mean, I've heard them discuss $2,000 a month. I've heard them discuss $4,000 a month. So I'm not really sure what it's going to be, but um, it's just like, okay, so everybody got recently $600 payment. So though most likely everybody's now going to get 2000 not everybody, but if you make less than 75 a year, you're most likely to get 2000 But what did the corporations get? What did Elon Musk get? That's right. Right? I mean... I don't know. Is that fair? <laughs> Linda, do you think the revalue is coming soon? I I think that they're working furiously on getting the central bank digital currency in place. So the answer, I'm hopeful that we have a couple more years, but I would not guarantee that. Once the UBI, again, the most important graph for you to pay attention to is the monetary velocity graph in the FRED. And if when you see that start to spike up in a pervasive way, not a little blip like these payments, but in a pervasive way, then what you know is that the hyperinflation has begun in earnest. Because if you know you're going to get $2,000 every month or $4,000 every month, then you're going to be more comfortable going out and spending it. These last ones, other than putting it in like Robinhood or stocks, but a lot of people saved that money because they were unsure of when they would start to have that income again. Okay, I'll let someone else ask you about real estate <laughs> because that will devalue our real estate. So I hope they, it, they pick that it, up. It will, but you know what? You, everybody has to have a place to live, right? True. And a place to make your last stand. And when March, I mean, March and April really gave us just a little sip of what we have ahead of us. So personally, where I found a hole in my personal strategy was that I did not have a bug out house. And a bug out house is someplace kind of off the grid that mm -hmm. since I live in central Phoenix and there were, you know, there were riots that were close enough to my house where I felt really uncomfortable just being honest about it. And I went, oh, there's a hole in my strategy. Because I had the food, the water, the energy. I had all that other stuff. Um, so uh, that's what I'm working on filling now and have been since this summer. Now, am I buying it at the top of the market? Absolutely, I'm buying it somewhere near the top of the market. But I have enough gold so that when, so I'm taking on a mortgage at virtually no interest rates because the interest rates are suppressed, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I have enough gold that when they do the reset, I will just pay that mortgage off. And it doesn't matter that I bought at the top of the market because I'm not buying it to sell it, right? If you're mm -hmm. speculating it uh, on it or something mm -hmm. like that, that's a different deal. But as long as you have that, like even if you can pay the property outright, don't do it. Get that fixed rate debt and you use the rest of the money to accumulate gold so that basically what right now might take you all the gold when this happens, maybe it'll only take a 20th of an ounce or a quarter of an ounce. Historically, I can tell you this, 
historically, 25 ounces of gold, or the equivalent, would buy an entire city block buildings at all. Mm -hmm. And if you convert your wealth into income-producing assets that you cannot outlive. When I first became a stockbroker, nobody ever talked about outliving your assets. But then again, you could get a treasury bond or a treasury note at like 10%. So you could generate income off of it. Now, all right, it's going up. It's like 1.67, although you probably get less than 1% on it by the time you do all the fees, right? So you're not generating any, any income or money off of that. And if you are investing, they're going to talk about how long you can live on the money that you have. Oh, you can live till you're 80. Well, wait a minute. If I live past 80, I still have to eat. I still have to keep right. a roof over my head. So in the strategy that I developed, you can't outlive that. And you get to pass it down to your children, your children's children. That's who I really care more about is the future. Because, hey, I'm in the last third of my life. So I've got maybe another... I think I'm going to live to 100, you know, and I'm 66. I think I got a shot. But, you know, my children and my grandchildren will live, and my great-grandchildren, which I don't have yet, but they're going to live a lot longer. I don't want them to be in the class of citizen that's leasing everything from somebody else. I want them to own it. So not only can I not outlive it, they can't outlive it. They can make stupid choices but they can't outlive it. That's where your trust comes in. Yeah. An assignment. Okay. Financial instruments, are they coming in new packages starting this year? More through what, treasury what? and new financial instruments. Oh, they're constantly, because it's called financial innovation. Let's create this product. Let's create okay. this product. I mean, the interest rate benchmarks, the cryptocurrencies, those are new products that they created. Will there be more? Yes, there will be more. They will, there will be more, but that doesn't mean that they have value. What can okay. you convert them into? That goes You'll back. Us on that in the future, huh? I, I thank you kindly. kindly. Yeah, my pleasure. My pleasure. I really do. Have a good balance of your day as well. Thank you. You too. Thank you, ladies. Lynette, I want to uh, read off some data about African Americans and investing. Yeah. And this okay. was taken from uh, BET. Um, outside of retirement accounts, only 37% of African Americans own wealth building products such as stocks and mutual funds. Only 35% believe they're doing a good job for preparing for retirement. 33% yeah. have less than one month of funds saved for crises and less than 25% have amassed more than six months of emergency savings. And 58% are actively involved in educating their children on finances versus 48% of Caucasians. 40% rely on family members for information. Wow. Kind of and scary, isn't it? It's, it's, it's very scary. And very scary. We need to publish. And, and this is Black Enterprise. I'm sorry, yeah. Black Enterprise. My magazine is where yeah, this is coming yeah. from. Well, Wanda, we, we need to get that and publish that in the newsletter too. So we'll we'll get that later. Yeah. And we and you need to do more of these kinds of things to help people understand what money is because it's it's hard for the black community. It's hard for for every normal person, but you know, you can do you can accumulate this stuff with very little money. And so Wherever you're at, you just start to accumulate. And I'll, I'll give you guys another tip because most antique dealers really don't have a clue about this. Most people don't have a clue about this. But, it, but you know, they're out buying like my uncle was and they'll get some sterling silver or something like that that is just dent and broken and what have you and they'll feel like, well, I can't put it in my booth or I can't sell it, right? But if you go into those and, and you can call any like any mall, antique mall or whatever, and say, do you have a dealer that buys silver, right? 
You could go to them and say, hey, I'll pay you spot. And you can start to, if you have 20 bucks, you can start to accumulate. If you have 10 bucks, you can start to accumulate. Don't lose it and don't sell it. Just accumulate it. My father, who uh, passed away when he was 91 years old, he <laughs> stored silver coins. And he would store them. And he had a, a, a safe that he would store them in. And he would dare anybody to go into his room and get near his safe. But, you know, back then I wasn't educated about silver coins. And I just thought, well, you know, he's just scared that there's going to be another depression and doesn't want his money to be taken away from him. He was right. So, yeah, he was right. Do you still have those? You know, unfortunately, um, there were some things that happened when he passed away and I had, was not in possession of those coins. And there were other family members that got possession of those coins. Yep, and that's, that's way too bad because, you know, he remembers, he lived his life through the depression and other things. So he knows how bad it can get and he knows what the government will do. And, you know, I remember President Johnson, you know, when they took the silver out of the coins. So you want to go pre-1964, when they took the silver out of the coins and came on air amazingly and admitted that the government would manipulate the price to crush you. I mean, they, it, it's hiding in plain sight. So I'm sorry you don't still have those coins, but he was right. He also collected stamps too. <laughs> well, if they were so, good stamps, yeah, they, they would have some collectible value too. Yeah. Yeah. That's a rare collectible. So if we wanted to set up an account, what would we do? Well, you would call us or you could go online, but you could call us at 888-696-4653. And then they will set you up with, an, with a consultant and the first thing you're going to talk about is what your goals are and what you're trying to accomplish and what you have to work with. And then they'll set you up with a strategy on how you're going to get there. So wherever you're starting, where are you going to get to? And it really is just that simple. Last thing, um, Lynette, I know that we're going through a pandemic right now. Yes. And actually, I've heard and read that we may be going through another pandemic in 2025. And I read this in a journal that was put together by John Hopkins Hospital, another pandemic that they say will be coming in 2025 after we, we finish with this one. Um, not good, but- Oh, not good. You know, as we are going through the next two years of this so-called reset, and this reset has been in existence and they've been working on it for years. Oh yeah, uh, the system died in 2008. Now, absolutely, I've been talking about it since then. And uh, 2009, when the head of the IMF came out on a Bloomberg interview and probably used the term reset about 27 or 28 times, I went, oh crap. And this is to reset the entire global market. It's not just the US because oh, all of these fiat currencies are going down and inflation is high and they didn't know what to do. Right. But the pandemic gave them an actual great excuse for escalating this process, And right? Yeah, um, the timing was great for them, wasn't it? <laughs> what yeah, a shocker, what a yeah, coincidence. It's, yeah, it's a, that's real coincidence. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So as, we, as we're going through this um, pandemic and they're giving us stimulus money what should we be doing? Because I know because I know the stimulus isn't going to last. Well, if they do mm -hmm. UBI, as long as you can convert, I mean, look, you, you got to get rid of that variable rate interest. There's not a huge rush right now, but you got to pay attention to the interest rates when they lose control of them. Then there's going to be Hades to pay. But you got to get rid of that variable rate interest rate debt and then start to accumulate gold and silver in any form that you can as well as food i mean in march did any of you have any problems getting toilet paper or getting food and you saw the grocery store shelves bare 
And even recently, um, you know, Jacqueline went to Washington because her daughter was getting married and she sent me images there where the grocery store shelves are bare. The food chain has broken down and it has not been fixed. What happened in March and April was just a little sip, a little taste of what we have in front of us. So you want to make sure and secure food, water, security, energy, community, barterability, wealth preservation, and shelter. You got to be prepared with all of those things so that you can be as independent and self-sufficient as possible. And your community can help you do that. So maybe you don't know how to garden, but maybe there's a community garden or maybe your neighbor knows how to do it. And you can go and spend, I mean, if people come and spend some time in my garden, they go, they go home with big bags full of stuff, right? So this is really what we need to do. Gold and silver are the barter ability and it'll preserve your wealth. And it'll put you in the position to take advantage of what they are doing for themselves, right? Because when this real estate, look at commercial real estate, right? I mean, it's a joke with what's going on and yet the valuation is still high though it's starting to fall when that goes down you have to be strategic is this is this commercial piece of commercial real estate really something that's viable or i don't know how about the parking lot that is attached to the government building that they're going to maintain that right and even though that sounds outrageous in so many ways but in this country, governments have already started selling off their income producing assets because when you sell something, you got to buy, you can only sell something that there's a market for. And again, I'll go back to it. Broadest base of buyer. Now, not necessarily the collectible coin. So there is a big market for that. But it's in manufacturing, it's in medical, it's in the financial system, it's in art, it's in jewelry. I mean, it's used across the entire global spectrum of the economy. So is silver. And they have attributes that they have not been able to duplicate in the labs. So you got to, the way that I did it, was that was that is my mantra and i did it in layers because you know you can't really necessarily i couldn't anyway just go in and do everything all at once so i say okay where do i feel the most vulnerable and you know i remember saying yeah this back door the way that it's set up anybody could just walk by and boom kick it right open so i felt really vulnerable so i put in a security door now that can't happen, right? And then I, and then maybe I worked on the water and maybe I accumulated some gold and silver. You know what I'm saying? So, so look at your personal, where you are personally, what you have the ability to do, what your means are, and really where you feel the most vulnerable. If it's your wealth, then you start to accumulate the gold and silver up to a level because you got to get all the rest of those things done too. And we have a, we have a, a slight window. Yeah, we are beginning to also promote the cooperative business model as a way for, uh, to promote community and uh, just equitable uh, finances as far as the workers, worker is concerned. Uh, so that's something that we want to educate the people about as well. Do you know that the uh, owner of Overstock.com laid in a whole bunch of gold to pay his workers in gold? Wow. Smart man. I love it. Yep. Do we have any more questions from the audience? Is this yours? Uh, because Edgar put up, does your company have resources to reach research old silver coins? Was that your question? Yes. Okay. The answer is yes. We've been around since 1995. And so we have connections with all the biggest um, wholesalers. 
Plus, I'm not a numismatist. That is not my thing. I'm a strategist. Uh, but we do have people here that also understand. So, so the answer is yes, we do have those resources. But you can also go out and pick up the most current red book. It's probably 10 or 15 bucks. And that'll cover all of the coins that are out there. What you're probably not going to be able to find is what's the quality of that coin. And so that's where we can help you as well. Because um, let's say you have a bunch of coins and you go, you know, man, these look pretty good to me. First of all, don't polish them, okay? Even if they're tarnished, don't rub them. But then what you would do is you would send them in. And it's a long process. It takes about six weeks. But you would send them in and then we would review them here. If they look like what's called gradable, then we would sell, send them off to the wholesalers that would examine them. If those look gradable, then they'll send them into the grading service. So you have something that's like this, which is a one ounce silver coin, probably going for like about 30 bucks at the moment, somewhere in there. But you know, it's been used in circulation and it's probably a more common date, it's not great. But if it's gradable, then they'll turn around and they'll put it in, a, this is called a slab, and it's tamper-proof. And then that guarantee, and they'll embed all the information in it, and then that guarantees that it is what you say that it is, but you've got to be careful about the grading service. NGC or PCGS are the two that are globally accepted at 100% of whatever it is that they say. So... Uh, if it's gradable, then we'll send them over to get graded. And unless this is changed, so, because again, I don't really work in this area, but the only costs to do that are direct costs. So shipping costs and grading costs. You know, we, it's, that's, that's not how we make our money. So we just do that as a service, but we're happy to do it. How about stamps? Don't do anything with stamps. You need to find a really good um, dealer that works in that arena. But uh, I know that there are some very, 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 very valuable stamps, and that would fall in the category of dynastic wealth stamps, I mean, if they're rare enough. Okay, can, can you elaborate a little bit? Uh, I, I think, I believe I missed it in the beginning about the, the currency reset. Sure. Uh, you know, every currency, like everything, there's always a life cycle. And we're at the end of this currency's life cycle. And uh, can you, Edgar, are those slides up there? These are just a few slides that show you the breakdown going into the reset. So there's a lot of crazy things that are going on with money creation, which when we go to UBI, Universal Basic Income, all of the money that right now they're creating and putting into the system will be generating that hyperinflation. But they're taking us to digital currency. And most of it will be in central bank digital currency. And so the currency system right now, like gold, is commodity money. It's real, it's physical, and it's got uses everywhere. The bills in your wallet... Those are Federal Reserve notes. So that's debt money, which is in their control. They control the value through inflation, more or less. Uh, but if you're holding bills outside of the system, it's still private. Well, we're, we're already transitioning into the full surveillance economy. The central bank digital currency, and these are their words, not mine, is programmable money. So that's how they can control it. And they can also control the privacy, the anonymity. Who do you think is going to have that anonymity? Probably not you or me, right? But, um, yeah, so we are transitioning in because the system is broken down. And officially, I don't have one of those graphs in here, but officially, there's less than three cents out of the original dollar's worth of purchasing power left. And... We're anchored at zero on interest rates. And, and most people don't realize this. And here's a big part of the problem. The way that governments and central banks, particularly central banks, control inflation 
is by uh, moving interest rates up or down. If they want to stimulate the economy, get more people to spend, then they lower interest rates and that inspires you to borrow and to spend. If inflation is running too hot and you notice it, then they'll raise interest rates, which means that people will borrow less and therefore spend less. So that's, that's the pattern. But you've got 90% of the developed world that are anchored at zero or near zero percent. And without exception, the negative rates, so minus rates, came in in 2009, and Sweden was the first country to do that. Without exception, every single country, including ours, that have attempted to raise interest rates and run off their balance sheet has failed, absolutely failed. And, you know, you can see that in this debt-to-GDP graph, right? Failed. This little area here, well, here, actually, this is their balance sheet. This is where they made that attempt to run off their balance sheet and to raise rates. Didn't work. This is where they are right now. And look at lockstep with stocks. Is that just a coincidence, you think? So what we're witnessing here is the breakdown of a complex financial system. And they are working furiously on getting the new digital system in place. And keep in mind, China is leading this charge. They will certainly be the first one to come out with a central bank digital currency, but they've really shown the world how to surveil their entire population. If you jaywalk in China, by the time you get to the other side of the street, the fine for jaywalking is already out of your account. And one of the, one of the papers I read from the International Monetary Fund, they used a car as an example, right? With all this smart technology, let's say you don't make your car payment. Well, they lock you out of the car. Boom. Then nobody physically has to go and get the car because if you still don't make your car payment, they will simply self-driving cars drive that car away. That was the example that the IMF used. That's not my example. That's their example. You have a smart house. You don't make your mortgage payment. Boom. You're locked out. You don't make your tax payment. Boom. Locked out. Well, that is not the kind of world that I want to leave to my children. And I get, well, I don't really get that we have absolutely no choice. Because I feel like you know, if we get enough people understanding what I just showed you here today, they can't get away with it. I had one more question about um, enterprise zones, um, Lynette, and I heard, I was doing some reading, um, how a lot of the the uh, people that are, the businesses, small businesses are going out of business, they have to close their shops, the restaurants and stuff. and. That's by design, and because the big corporations are gobbling up, uh, absolutely enterprise zone properties and stuff. So uh, I've been reading. This is all by design, and I live here in in San Jose, and I'm seeing it up and down my street, yeah. in the San Francisco Bay Area. But through the government contracts program, they talk about the enterprise zones and how people can purchase. Um, property and build their businesses within the enterprise zone, but I also recognize it is a um, it's a it's a it's a um, uh, uh, what's the word? And it's a, there's a lot of inequity around that because only the good old boys know how to um, buy that property. I think that they are going to be uh, coming out with a new PPP that is a lot simpler because. Again, when you have a pandemic, there's a certain period of time and rioting and disillusionment. And they, you know, I mean, that's what is the biggest threat to the government and to the central banks is people losing trust and confidence in them. And so they're going to try and appease it. So that could create potentially some opportunities. I, I just have a problem when I see the 
um, banking institution paying the corporate rate. Well, first of all, I learned that corporations get zero interest loans from the government. Yeah. Like, why can't we? And that's part. I just sent Jackie the, my petition so you can read later on. Why can't we get access to zero interest loans as small businesses? As as uh, for me, I'm representing Black female entrepreneurs. So why can't we get zero interest loans um, to uh, help us? Uh, uh, build our businesses and create sustainable businesses and for and because a lot of us don't have credit we don't have banking relationships obviously um, and the system is automatically uh, systemically racist in um, there's disparity within the system automatically right and so how do we create new resources to prevent that from happening so that that would be a great conversation to have with you to help and then um, the whole thing about the zero interest loan, that kind of blew my mind. And then you brought up in one of your sessions about the um, about the, the banking system um, taking the extra interest off the books for a lot of the corporations because they've accumulated so much debt. Oh, yeah. You, you, you're referring to the zombie corporations? Yeah. I yeah. my paper, but the zombie corporations, yes. Yeah, absolutely. And these are corporations that for at least three years have not earned enough to pay the interest on their debt, let alone any principal. And then the banks keep loading the money to pay the interest so that they don't have to take the write down on their books. And that's got to do with the stock market. But how how do we use, how do we expose that information? And so we can leverage to get what we want from the government or who to create these new financial tools for um, small businesses. That's what I'm saying. Cause we don't know that information. Right. But the, but you know, the thing is, is that all that information and lots more is, is published. It, it's there. It's not, I don't have any special access to anything, but the difference is, is that I know where to look and I'm tenacious. Well, I, so, got, I got that information from you. <laughs> exactly. But I, you know, it's because I'm, I'm seeking it, but yeah, we can probably, uh, you know, I, I look, Nobody lives a life unscathed that when I became a stockbroker, I remember going, I don't really know who I am, but I know this, I'm an entrepreneur. A hundred bazillion percent. And, you know, so even though there's a lot of demise going on, there's always opportunity in crisis, always. And so if you've got brilliant minds coming together, we could probably figure it out. Any other questions? Any I like other? what you just said, Lynette. Um, yeah. Spiritually, it's like in the darkness, there is always a speck of light. Yes. Oh, you just gave me chills. Yep. It's been a pleasure, Lynette. And we look forward to working with you again. Um, and I'm sure that Lisa will find some dates in the future for Absolutely. us to do this again and again and again until we yep. get it. Yep. And, and it sounds like there's other things in the works too. And, uh, you know, maybe I can be involved in that as well. Hold on one everybody, this is Lisa Riley with Odo Synergy Services, Women of Color Global Entrepreneur Network. And we just had the phenomenal Lynette Zane with us today for the first time, kicking off 2021, an economic reset. And we're going to be bringing her back in the future and talking about um, other options and ways to protect our um, financial resources, wealth building, and preparing for um, this economic, protecting ourselves from this economic uh, crazy. Have a great rest of the week. God bless and take care.